All right, Second Peter chapter one. Now, just reading the scripture there, I love verse four. It just popped out of me as I'm listening to Brother Nick read, where it says, "Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises." So, the Bible showing us there that through Jesus Christ and through the knowledge of Him, there are very uh, there are great and precious promises that are given unto us. And one of those great and precious promises actually listed there in Second Peter chapter one, where the Bible reads in verse nineteen. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prop prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So there's a promise there in the end that's showing us that we have a preserved word of God that is given to us, and that it was given to us as holy men of old were moved by the Holy Ghost, and they spake. And that's how we believe we've received uh, the Bible. We've received it through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and God has preserved His word down through the ages. And today we have that perfect and preserved word of God in the King James Version. That's what we believe. Here at Faithful Word, we are a King James-only church. And I want to just kind of talk about this uh, this morning, about why we are King James-only. Why is it? And not necessarily for all of the, the, the normal reasons you might hear in a, in a King James only sermon. Now here in, verse, in verses 19 through 21 we have this very plain statement that the Bible declares itself to be the Word of God. I mean that is what it says there. It says that, that the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men spake, men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, saying that's how we know we've received the Scriptures. That's how we know that the Bible is not of any uh, prophecy of any private interpretation. But it's something that God inspired through holy men of old and that God has preserved down through the ages. That's the plain statement that the Bible is making here. That's what it's telling us is that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, the question I want to ask us is that do we take the Bible to mean what it says when it declares itself to be the Word of God? When the Bible makes such a declaration that it is the Word of God, when it gives us a precious promise that it is the Word of God, do we take it at face value that it is the Word of God as it declares itself to be? Or is it that we need other, other proofs? We say, yeah, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, but it sure would be helpful if I could go to some other sources and have them, you know, shore me up. And then maybe I could put all my faith in the fact that the King James Bible is the Word of God. Or that the Bible is the Word of God. Do we need to go to other proofs? Do we need to go to outside sources, outside the precious promises of the Word of God, that it is the Word of God? Do we need to have some kind of a scholastic understanding of textual criticism? Do we need to understand what it means... To, uh, to, to, to examine the scriptures and, and the originals and, to, and, to, and look at how people interpret, interpret the, the, the Greek and Hebrew texts and understand all these you know, very scholastic, very educated um, methods of interpretation? Or do we need to have knowledge of the many errors and alterations that are made in, in the modern versions? Which is great. I, I always appreciate when a preacher stands up and points out, you know, because there's nothing more damning than just the black and white words in some of these new versions where it just takes out where it replaces Jesus Christ with Lucifer and Lucifer with Jesus Christ where key doctrinal verses are just removed from the, from the, from the text or altered in such a way that they mean something completely different than what they have in the, in, in the Greek. Do we need that? Do we need someone to stand up and, and show us those things? Do we need to, to be able to comprehend it and prove the, trans, the translator's ability to give us the English version that we have today? In the King James, do we need to know about all the the seventy trans uh, the, all the the translators back in in, in uh, King James time and all about the seven years they spent laboring and and, and uh, correctly uh, translating the Word of God from the original languages into the Greek or into the English? Excuse me. Do we have to have knowledge of all the preceding English versions that came before the King James to just simply trust what the Bible says when it says that it is the Word of God, that it is the preserved Word of God? Or is it that we can just take these declarations like we find here in 2 Peter by faith? Is it, can we just take what the Bible, what it says by faith and trust that it is the Word of God? That God is, can preserve and inspire and keep His Word down to the ages. Now, before I get into that, I, I would just ask us to maybe consider some of the other declarations of Scripture that we simply take by faith. You know, creation is one that comes to mind. You know, we believe in a six-day creation. We believe that God created all the, the heavens and the earth and all things that are there, and within six days, God created those things. 
We believe that by faith. We don't need to have somebody show us fossils or, or do all these you know, uh, seminars and all these other things. We can believe these things by faith. Those things are great and can help shore up and they can help maybe win people over that have been uh, deluded by these lies and things like that. But we as Christians, when it comes down to it, we have to believe these things by faith. We could talk about end times prophecy. Do we believe the things that the Bible describes that are yet to come? The, uh, the tribulation, the great tribulation, the second coming of Christ. Do we need to have some kind of infallible proof outside the Word of God to believe those things? Or do we simply just believe those things by faith? And then last of all, but not least by any means, is our own salvation. Do we trust our own salvation by faith in the, in, the, in the Word of God? Or do we need some other man to declare us saved? Or do we need some church to declare us whether or not we're saved? Do we need some kind of a, a sacrament or, or some kind of a, a baptism or whatever it might be that someone else could, from an outside source could declare whether or not we're going to heaven? Or do we simply just trust what the Bible says by faith? The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, in verse 20, it says, Knowing this, knowing this, that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's a plain declaration in Scripture that the Bible is something that was given to us by God through the Holy Ghost, by holy men of old. And we believe that today by faith. That's how we're, why we're King James only, at least for myself. I'm King James alone by faith alone. That's the title of the sermon this morning. King James alone by faith alone. Now how is it that we know? How is it that, that, that Peter could make such a statement just say, knowing this? You know, no doubt. Not having a pretty good idea or not feeling pretty sure about this or not having a pretty good feeling or we're pretty convinced that we have the Word of God. No, he said knowing this. There was no doubt in Peter's mind that he was speaking the Word of God, that he had the Word of God. And if you would quickly just turn over to John chapter 10. John chapter, chapter 10. So how is it that we know? How can we know like Peter knew? I mean, how can we just say, well, we're King James alone by faith alone? And we'll catch a lot of, a flack, uh, a lot of flack for that. There's a lot of people out there that, that would, would say, well, that's just circular reasoning. You can't just trust the word, the Bible to be the Word of God because it says it's the Word of God. But that really, when it comes down to it, that's, that's the case, like it or lump it. Yeah, you can call it circular reasoning. You can call it whatever you want. I call it faith in the Word of God. I call it the fact that I just believe what the Bible says. Jesus said in, in John chapter 10, verse 4, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him. They know not the voice of strangers. One of the greatest proofs I've ever had for myself that the King James Bible is the Word of God is that whenever I've tried to read another version, I remember early on in my Christian life, you know, I was I had somebody try to tell me that the King James wasn't, you know, preserved, that you could read these other versions and that they were every bit as good. So I tried them. But it was I noticed such a marked difference between the power and the scripture of the King James and the and that which lacked in these other versions. And when I know now looking back, it's that I didn't hear the voice of the shepherd in those in those pages. When I read the King James, I can hear the voice of the shepherd. It has power. There's something that speaks to me in the King James. And we spend daily Bible reading in our Bibles. I mean, there's times when we're just moved by the Scripture. When we read a certain verse, it's something that just speaks to our heart. The Holy Spirit can bear witness with our spirit. And we can see that we can hear the voice and we can know that we, through the power of the King James Bible, that it is the Word of God. That's how we can know that the King James Bible is uh, the Word of God, by faith. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And can we not hear the voice of the shepherd when we read the Bible? When we read the King James Version, can we not hear the voice of the shepherd? See, we can hear the voice of God in His Word. We can read it, and we can and know the power of it. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, And because ye are sons... God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. When we get born again, when we become a child of God, God sends His forth His Spirit into, our, into, into us, into our hearts. And then we can have that witness, and we can cry, as it says there, Abba, Father. I mean, we, we have this, this, this relationship with God, this, this, uh, this standing before God that we can hear Him and, and He can hear us. And how does God speak to us? Does He speak to us in an audible voice today? Do the heavens open and we hear God speak? No, we hear God through His Word. 
So when we read the King James Version, we can hear God speaking to us. When God, or when we're, we're meditating on the Word of God, or we're thinking about something, the Holy Spirit can bring to remembrance those things that we've read or heard from the King James Bible. We can see that that's how we can know this, that the King James Bible is the Word of God, because God is using it and speaking to us through the King James, through the Bible. The Bible says in Romans 8, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You see, we're King James alone, by faith alone, because we hear the voice of the shepherd. It's his spirit that bears witness with our spirit when we read the Word of God. Now that's one way that we can know this, that we can know that we have an inerrant, inspired, and preserved Word of God in the King James Version. It's simply because of the, the fact that those that are, that are born again that have that spirit bearing witness with God's spirit can be spoken to through it. And not only that, but we can see that you know, creation is a testimony of God's power to preserve His Word. And if I could at this point, I just want to talk a little bit about, about my own testimony. About not only how I came to a saving knowledge of Christ, but also how I came to be King James alone. How I became, became a King James onlyist. <clears throat> now, the Bible says um, when I, in Psalms 8, if you would turn to Psalm 8, the Bible says in Psalm 8, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? So we see here that David's saying when he considers the heavens. And that's really kind of how God brought me around to, to, to understand who he was. And well, I'm not speaking in some mystical, uh, you know, you know, sage-like sense or anything like that, but I'm just trying to show you that even in Scripture, you know, we see great men of God looking to the heavens and considering the heavens and giving God glory for it. When I was about 18 years old, my parents divorced when I was very young. And I grew up in a godless home. I grew up in a very liberal home. I did not grow up. I mean, not, I, I wouldn't have, I don't have a single family member that would darken the door of a church like this, let alone any church probably. And uh, I, I grew up in a very, and I grew up in the public school system. I was taught evolution. I was taught all those things that we're made to believe in society today. Um, I grew up well into my teens. And even, you know, when I was about 18 years old, I went to live with my dad in the United States uh, Virgin Islands, in the island of St. Croix. And out there, you know, I, I, uh, I was living a very wicked life. I was working in a, as a cook in a, in a bar, um, you know, taking part in everything that goes along with that. And, um, but many times I would walk, I, and often my, the, where my dad, where I was living with my dad and where I worked were, were miles apart. They were about three to five miles apart. And I walked every day. I would walk there and I would walk back. And when I walked back, I would walk back at night. And it was down the, one of these winding jungle roads up in the mountains of the of the uh, of Saint Croix, and I can't remember. I can't tell you how many times I'd be walking up that road and just gazing up at the stars because there, you know, the, the light pollution is so low. You can actually see a lot of the different uh, constellations that you can't see in other parts of the world because there's just not not enough light to really drown it out. And when you get back there in those jungle roads, man, it's it's just pitch black, and the stars are just so much more brilliant, so much more bright. And you can see constellations there you can't see. You're like, well, you can see the Southern Cross down there, which is neat. But the point I'm trying to make here is that I would, as I was walking down those roads and looking at those stars, I began to think about God. You know, not necessarily Jesus Christ or the Bible, but just about who God was. You know, what are, are, are we, did we just happen to come, you know, this all just happened by chance, as they would have us to believe through, you know, an evolution. That there was a big bang and then everything came from nothing and here we are, bada boom, bada bing, you know. Or it was it, you know, that there was a creator, that there was a God, that there was some, you know, something greater than myself. And it doesn't take long of looking up those stars to realize that there is something greater than yourself. I mean, the heavens give witness that, that there, there is a God. And I was convinced of his existence by those stars as I began to look up at those stars. And that's not something that's far-fetched, and I believe God gives us those stars and the constellations and, and the, the majesty of the heavens to declare his glory to us. The Bible says in Isaiah 42, Thus saith the Lord God, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, 
and spirit to them that walk therein. Isaiah 45, verse 11, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and His Maker, Ask of me things concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. That's powerful scripture. That's a powerful testimony of the power and might of God. That God is able to just stretch out the heavens and command all the hosts thereof. That God gives breath to everything that walks upon the earth. And growing up in a, in a godless home and living that wicked life, and, you, and many people in the world say, man, you had it all. You know, you're living in the Caribbean as a young man. They'd say, you had the world by the tail. But I knew but through the witness of those stars that there was something more to life than I was, than I was getting out of it. There was yeah. something more meaningful. And God used those stars to prod me and to, sh begin to, I, and, and to at least show me you know, His power and His might. I might not have known who He was at that time. Now you say, wow, this is getting pretty mystical. You know, this is getting pretty far-fetched. But when you think about it, if you turn back to Genesis chapter 15, it's really not that far-fetched. I mean, we've looked at, at Isaiah here. We've read uh, uh, David all declaring you know, you know, uh, great admiration for, for the heavens and showing, you know, and God speaking about the heavens, about His power, how it's declared through it. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 15, we we'll look at another great man that was convinced of God by the stars. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless in the steward of my house, and the steward of this house? Of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born of mine house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, no, notice there. It's the word of the Lord coming unto him. It's not God himself. It's the word. It's, it's, it's God speaking to Abraham. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Thou shalt not be that these this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. He's making a promise just through his word. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said, So shall thy seed be. So he tells him, just look at the stars, Abraham, and believe the word I'm speaking to you. He didn't, he didn't sit down and, and try to like make some kind of a contract with them. There was no legal, legally binding you know, agreement that could, he could take God to court if he didn't get that error. No, he just said, you know what, Abraham, I'm saying it to you. Look at the stars and believe me. The Bible says in verse 6, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And I believe that's you know, a great passage showing us the salvation of Abraham. The great passage is showing us that salvation has been the same down through the ages, even in the time of Abraham, that it's been by faith, by believing the word of the Lord that he has spoken to you, by believing the promise of God. And he looked at those stars. So we, we see that looking at the stars, and the point I'm trying to make here is that when we consider the power of God's, of God's creation, you know, is it really that far-fetched to believe that God could write and preserve a book? You see, I was saved by grace through faith. After I lived there in the Virgin Islands for a few years, I came back to the United States. My life was just a mess living in northern Michigan. I mean, I was couldn't hold down a job, just, you know, had all this. I don't want to go into any details, but the long, long and short of it is this, is that somebody got me in a church. And when I was in that church, I'd never even gone to a church. I'd gone to a few masses with my, my aunt around the holidays here and there, but I've never actually gone to a church, you know, just to by my own will. I was kind of drugged to the other ones. So I said, I'm going to go check it out. And long story short, some, a preacher got up, you know, gave an invitation for anybody who wanted to accept Christ, and he gave a clear presentation of the gospel. And it was the first time at that service I understood that Jesus Christ died for my sins. Not that he was taken against his will, not that he was murdered, but he was murdered, don't get me wrong, but not that he couldn't have done anything about it. And that was the first time that I understood that all I had to do was simply believe on him. That all I had to do was put my faith and tr trust in what Christ has already done for me. And then he died and was buried and rose again. I came forward to that service. A young man came out of the congregation and, and sat down with the Bible and showed me clearly from the Scripture that I was a sinner, that I deserved hell, that Jesus Christ died for all my sins, and that if I just put my faith and trust in him, I could be saved. And I did that that day. And that was a great day in my life. But the point I'm, I'm you know, trying to make here is that that wasn't the end of it. That was really just the beginning. And as I, 
I wanted to learn more about God at that point, you know, and, and unfortunately at that point in my life, you know, I hadn't been grounded in a good church. The church that I was in was, they had the gospel right, and that's really all I can say for them. They at least had the gospel right. And, you know, he wasn't against the King James Version, and I'm sure the young man that came forward, I, can't, I couldn't tell you what version it was, but I'm, it must have been a King James because I got born again. And uh, at that time, I kind of started to let these corrupt influences start to, corrupt sources start to influence me in my thinking. Because here's the thing, if the devil doesn't, can't keep you lost, he wants to keep you confused. If the devil can't keep you from getting saved, he wants to, once you get saved, he wants you as confused as he can get you yeah. so that you, can't, you can be not be used of God. So he can just keep you from, like the Bible says, you know, being like a, a, a just tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Never stable, never moving forward, just tossed to and fro, you know, and, and just being uh, not profitable to God in this life. If the devil can't keep you lost, he will try and keep you confused. And that's easy to do to a young man who did not grow up with any kind of a, a, a godly foundation in his life and find, you know, got saved later in life. And then uh, when you're living in northern Michigan as a young man in the middle of winter, there's really not a whole lot to do. You know, if you're gonna, especially if you're going to try and live for God and get some sin out of your life. So sure enough, I find myself you know, at that time down in the public library at that great well of wisdom and that oracle of truth known as the Internet. Right? That's where we just we glean so much solid, great doctrine is, is online. Right? And there I was. And sure enough, it didn't take long before the devil started to use that to confuse me. And I got caught up a little bit <coughs> with the sacred name movement. You know, and I really don't want to go into a lot about why I believe that's false this morning, why I believe that Jesus Christ is the name above all names, why that's the name, you know, there's no other name given up, uh, under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue should confess uh, that, he, that he is Lord of the glory of God. I kind of butchered that one. But the point I'm trying to make is I got caught up in that a little bit. They're trying to tell me his name is something else. And I'm trying to read my Bible and say, well, when it says Jesus, doesn't it mean Jesus? No, no, there's, they're telling me there's another name. This, the, 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 the Bibles you're reading, they're all wrong when they use Jesus. You've got to start calling them by this other name. And granted, this was, you know, 15 plus years ago. And this thing has only taken, this, this, whole, this whole movement's only gotten crazier. It's only taken off more. There's the sacred name movement and the Hebrew roots movement and the Yeshua thing. It's all just skyrocketed since then. And after salvation, after I got saved and put my faith and trust in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I allowed these people, through my own idleness, to start to cast doubt on that name. And, and what they're doing, really, is they're casting doubt on God's Word. That's really the attack that they were putting on it. They're trying to cause me to doubt the, the validity of God's Word, that it was true, that every word was perfect. They cast doubt on God's Word, and that's the attack that they were making. And you know that's that's a terrible thing when you have that's basically just like having the, your legs just wiped out right out from under you. It's having the carpet pulled right out from under you. The Bible says that the foundations be destroyed. What can the righteous do? You know if we don't have a solid word of God, if we do not have an inerrant, preserved word of God, then everything's up for grabs. Right. Every doctrine is, is can be questioned. Everything that we believe can be called into question. Well, is that really what the Bible says? Are you sure that's not an error? You sure that shouldn't be interpreted this way? Everything is, is up for grabs at that point. And I determined at that point, I remember this clear as day, I'm driving down in Traverse City, Michigan, US 31 along Bayshore Drive. My wife knows what I'm talking about. You know, right around where the old factory was by the open space. And I remember I had my Bible up in my dash like that. And I'm just confused. I've been, you know, is it Jesus? Is it this name? Is it, you know, they get into the horoscopes and the astrology and all this stuff. And it was just so much confusion racing through my mind. But I remembered, I knew one thing that I was a sinner, that Jesus Christ was God, that He died for my sins, and I put my trust in Him, and I got saved that day. And no one could shake me from that. But I saw what was going on, I said, I remember I had the Bible on my desk, and I just looked at it, and I said, you know what? If the God that made the stars and the heavens and everything that is, if He can do all that, surely He can preserve a book. Surely God can write a book. I mean, we're talking about a book just... You know, a few th uh, just a, just shy of a few of two thousand pages. Is it really that far fetched to think that God could write a book and preserve it? I mean, we believe everything else by faith. We believe in the creation story by faith. We put our own salvation in God's word by faith. Why then would we doubt the preservation and the inspiration of God's word? It's something that should be accepted by faith. Amen. 
You see, David praised God's name when he considered the heavens. It says in verse 9, I don't know if you're still there in Psalm, I'd have you, it doesn't matter. He said, O oh Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. When he considered the heavens, when he saw the stars and the skies and everything, he said, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. He didn't question God's power to preserve his creation. He didn't say, God, when I, when I consider the heavens and the stars, I wonder if you're really able to keep them up there. I really wonder if you're, if you're able to do what you say you can do. God's creation testifies of his ability to write a book. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Is that when we consider the heavens and we consider the majesty of the heavens and God's great might and power, it, it's a testimony to his ability and his power to write something as simple as a book in our language. Now, at this point in my life, I had already kind of met some King James only people and I'd read their material and um, I, that ended up leading. I said, you know what, that it's King James. I said, either it is or it isn't. You know, I, I, I kind of understood the issue a little bit and I got myself in a good church and I've never had to go back on that. I've never had to go back and well, let me re-examine, you know, the, the Texas Receptus and compare it to the, the, the Sinaiticus and all these other, you know, sources. I found a King James church, I got in it, and I stayed with it. And I came to understand the issue of the King James only after I accepted it by faith. It wasn't that I proved it by faith, well, proved it and then came to accept it. I said either the King James is or it isn't. Either God can preserve his word or he can't. And that's how I came to became, become King James only. The same way I came to God by faith. That's how I became King James only, by faith. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26, Lift up your, high, your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might. For that he is strong in power, not one faileth. That's a great verse. God said, he's saying here that, God calls all those stars by name. When we look at all those stars and we go, wow. We couldn't even begin to count them. You know, and science tells us that there's just billions. It's just endless. It goes on and on and on. But the Bible tells us that He called them all by names, by the greatness of His might. And not one fails. It reminds me also of that, that, that verse where, where, where Jesus said, you know, that one, that one sparrow fall to the earth without your Heavenly Father knowing it. God knows the, you know, every single little bird. God knows every star. So if God can sit back and God can number and name the host of heaven, if God knows every name of every star in heaven, can he not name his books? Can he not name 66 books in a Bible? If he can name the stars of heaven, can he not number every chapter? Can he not number every verse? Can he not know every word and syllable and letter of his own word? I mean, he can name all the stars in heaven. We, we believe that, we read that, we're moved by that verse. Wow, he called them all by name, by the greatness of his might. And we believe it by faith. Why then would we call in question the fact that that very word that inspires us, why would we call that in question, that, that, a verse like that? Well, maybe he meant something else in another version. Maybe, maybe that's just, you know, allegorical. Maybe that's just, you know, a very poetic verse. And I believe it means that what it says. He calleth them all by names. God knows the stars by names. And he can, number, can, he, can he not then preserve his word? Now it's good to understand the issue, and I don't want to cast doubt on you know or, or say that none of that's relevant. It's good to understand the, the issue of the King James only. Why we're King James only. It's good to understand the errors in the other versions. It's good to be able to correct the other versions and show them where the, why they're wrong. And it's good to understand how we've received the King James Version and be able to defend it. We should be able to, to, you know, it's good to know that. It's good to know how it was received through the text Receptus, how, you know, we received the, the other English versions that led up to it, and how God, we could see even in human history, how God refined His Word in the English Version and gave it to us. That's all great. But my faith in the King James Bible will never rest in a man. It will never rest in the, in the works of a man. It will never rest, you know... Pastor Anderson put out that great documentary, and I love it. It's probably one of my favorites. You know, um, New World Order of Bible Versions. I highly recommend that one, especially if, this, if that's something you're kind of you're questioning about. Is the King James really inspired and all? I think that's great. I think they're useful tools. But those things will never be the ultimate authority. Those things, we, at the end of the day, you have to come to it by faith. You have to accept that the King James Bible is what it says it is. That it is the preserve and inerrant word of God. And it will never rest in the defense of a man. My faith will never rest in some man being able to defend the King James. It will always rest in it by faith. 
I'll never need a documentary. I'll never need somebody to write some book about the King James to, to show me something wonderful about the King James. Those things can be edifying. Those things can be, be great, but it's not where my faith lies. It will always come down to faith. We are King James only because we believe the promises of God. We're, we're King James only because we understand the, the power of God's ability you know, in, in creation. And we believe that you know, if He can do all that, surely He can write this book. But not only that, but we believe it because we, we can hear His voice when we speak. Because this version, it has power. When we hear it, when we hear it read, when we, when we read it for ourselves, we know that there's power in those words. As Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. You're King James only because we believe the promises of God. We believe God's promises, do we not? Do we not believe the promises of God in, this, in the Scripture? We believe the promises about eternal security, at least I hope we do, where Jesus said, you know, uh, I am the, he said in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth me shall never die. That's a great promise from Jesus Christ that we have in the King James Version. That whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall never die. Then he asked, believest thou this? And we would say, yes, we believe that. We believe in eternal security. We believe in the promises of God that once we're saved, we're always saved. Jesus said in John chapter 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand, out of my Father's hand. So we believe these great promises out of the Word of God that they are, that, you know, the, the promise of eternal life. Jesus said in, verse, in John chapter 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. We put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We're passed from death unto life. We shall not come into condemnation. Our sins are under the blood. We have eternal security in Christ. We believe that because it says there, He that heareth my word. It's His word that we're putting our trust in. If we believe we have eternal life based on the word of God, why would we then not expect the word of God to be perfect? If we could put our faith in the promises of the word of God, why would we not then believe that the Word of God is perfect? Every promise of God is true, or none of them are. Or they're, like I said earlier, they're all up for grabs. Someone could say, well, I know He said, you shall not come into condemnation, or that you have everlasting life, that all you have to do is believe. I know it says all that, but you have to remember you know, the, the context of the times, and you have to understand that you know, the Bible is written by men. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've been out soul winning, and I'm thinking about one guy in particular a couple weeks ago, this young man. Normally, I don't spend a lot of time with people if they, if they don't want to hear it, but he was willing to listen. And he believed everything I was saying. It made sense to him. But the one thing it kept coming back to was, you know, I just, I just can't believe that, that the Bible's perfect. I just can't believe that it's, you know, it's, at the end of the day, it's just a book written by men. But he doesn't understand or believe that promise that we read in 2 Peter that Holy men of old were moved as they were, and spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's how he received it. And I quoted that verse, I showed it to him, but you know what? He didn't have the faith to believe that. He wanted someone to prove it to him. He wanted me to, you know, I told him flat out, I said, look, I can never prove to you that the Bible is the Word of God. I can't prove it to you. I can't take you to a museum. I can't take you to some display. I can't give you a DVD and convince you of it. At the end of the day, you have to believe it by faith. Just like we believe anything about the Word of God. You have to believe that the Bible is the Word of God by faith. And there's so many promises about the Word of God that it is the preserved and in an error Word of God. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. They're pure words. Every word in here is pure. There's not a word in here that shouldn't be in here. It says, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So even in David's day, he understood that the words that he had in the Word of God, those would be preserved from this generation forever. He understood that the words that he had were pure words. That they were, no, they were not corrupt. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, verse 5, Every word of God is pure. 
He is a shield unto them that, that, that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest thou be found, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. He's saying, not only is the Word of God pure, it's a shield. And that we need to put our trust in it. And we should not add unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Isaiah 59, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth forever. That's a great promise on the preservation of the Word of God. Do we not have the words that God put in Isaiah's mouth in our hands today? Has He not done exactly what He promised with Isaiah when He told them that the words that He put in His mouth would not depart, that they would be in the mouth of His seed and of His seed seeds forever? It's exactly what we have here. We have every word of Isaiah. All those words that God put in His mouth, we have preserved for us, just as He promised. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Think not I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. That's a great promise from Jesus Christ that God would preserve and keep His word. That not even one jot or tittle would fall from the law, would, would pass from the law. He said in Matthew 24, Heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away. That's a powerful statement from Jesus Christ. He said, the words that I speak, they shall not pass away. We have those words, do we not, in the Gospels, the book of Acts, the book of Revelation, all the things that our Lord said that He saw fit for us to receive through, through, uh, through the preservation of His Scripture. Hebrews chapter 4, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than two edged sword. That's a great verse. The Word of God is quick and powerful. Going back to that first point I made, how do we know that the, the Bible is the Word of God? Because it's quick and it's powerful. And it, it, it says that it's piercing, even of the binding asunder of soul and spirit. When you go out soul winning and you knock on a door and someone gives you the time of day to allow you to open your Bible and begin to show them the things of the Word of God. I, I just love how the Word of God does all the work for us. How all we have to do is go out and begin to show it to people. And people are so quick to agree with so much of it. The Bible says, for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. That's true. They'll nod their heads and say, yep. You know, and we'll show them all these, these great verses. We'll say, well, what does hell sound like to you? Describe hell. And it'll be just as the Bible describes it. A place of fire, a place of torment. Unless you get one of these goofballs, you know, that say some kind of weird answer. But a lot of times, the point, but the point I'm trying to make here is that the Bible is quick, it's powerful. And when we go out and we share it with others, it's, it does all the plowing for us. You know, all we got to do is just kind of steer the ox. And it, it just, it, it cuts right through that, that. It breaks up that fallow ground in their heart and allows us to plant that seed in there. It does all the work for us because it's quick, because it's powerful, because it is the Word of God. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Again, I'm telling you how many times I've been thinking about something or wanting to do something or, or had some kind of idea or a plan and something from the Word of God would just come to my mind and God would show me, you know why, why you really want to do that? You know why you really want, what, what he would reveal, you know, our own motivations in our heart for why we want to do or say something. It discerns the thoughts and the intents of our heart. God could just bring Scripture to, my, to our mind to show us these things. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. It says that through faith we understand by the word of God of, of the things that which were seen were not made of, were seen, were not, the things which are seen were not made of those things which do appear. It's by faith through his word. How can we have such great faith in the creation story? Just simply through His Word. And then people will just turn around and then call on the question whether or not the King James Bible is the preserved Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, 
but the word of the Lord shall endure, the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Peter had, knew that when he was preaching the gospel through the God's word, that he was preaching a word that would endure forever. That, that would never pass away. He understood that you know, we are saved by a faith in a perfect and inspired and a preserved word of God. That's how we're saved. That's how, we, that's how we know we have the promises that we have. Because we understand that the, the Bible is preserved, that it's perfect, and that it's inerrant. And if we allow others to cast out on that, then they can start to take away from us all those great and precious promises which we have in Christ. And at the end of the day, you know, maybe it's an issue that we need to study out. Maybe it's something that we need to decide we need to take the time to look at this. And we can, get, we can gather all the evidence and we can look at all the angles and we can look at all the debates and we can look at all the discussion and we can examine all the different modes of interpretation and we can understand all these things about textual criticism and try to get to the bottom of the issue. But at the end of the day, it's going to come down to this. Do you have faith that God is able to preserve His Word or not? That God is able to give us a perfect and inerrant Word of God in the King James Version. If you're going to be King James alone, you're going to do it by faith alone. That's how we're King James. It's through faith at the end of the day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you, for, thank you for a Bible that is preserved. Thank you for a Bible that is inerrant and perfect. Thank you that we have a Bible in our language, Lord, in abundance. Many of us, I'm sure, have just stacks of, of Bibles at home. We can collect them. Lord, we can go down to a... a a store and buy a, a, a paperback version of your word for a dollar where you've caused your word to, to abound. And Lord, it's powerful and we thank you for that. We thank you that we have these great precious promises given to us in the word of God. The promise of salvation, the promise of eternal security. Thank you for a word that speaks to our heart, Lord, that, that moves us, that or discerns our thoughts and our intents. Father, we just praise you for the, for the, for, for the word of God and Lord, we thank you for uh, salvation by grace and Lord, just pray now that you would bless us as we go our own ways and that you would help us to uh, just trust in your word that it is what it says it is Lord that it is uh, but it is the very word of God that we have in our hands we thank you for it in Jesus name amen, amen.